Hi, so I'm Karen Jex. I'm a senior solutions architect at Crunchy Data, and it's absolutely amazing to see so many of you in here today uh, to talk about how to tune Postgres to work even better. So, as you can see from this illustration, my career so far has been pretty database shaped. So I was a DBA for 20 years before I became a database consultant and now a solutions architect, but still focused just on databases and Postgres in particular. I've worked with a lot of application developers along the way, and I've learned a lot from them, and I still learn a lot from them. And I've always liked to share with them what I know about databases. I first gave this talk at a Python conference after asking the organizers which Postgres topics would be most interesting to the audience. And the main request I got was an overview of the most useful Postgres configuration parameters and how to set them. I've spent quite a lot of time at developer conferences over the last year or two, and I hear a lot of love for Postgres, which is really heartwarming. And one of the main things that we hear about Postgres is it just works. Of course, this is a Postgres conference. Hopefully, you've noticed that already. So the audience here might be slightly different. I'm actually really interested to know the makeup of the audience today. So. Um, do we have application developers here? Oh, thank goodness for that, because this talk is, <laughs> is written for you. OK, um, DBAs or similar type of roles? Hello, welcome. Sysadmins who've been roped into doing database administration, even though it's not really their job, yeah. DevOps people in the same situation, yeah. Postgres experts who are just here to keep tabs on me. So out of the box, the Postgres cluster has a really small footprint, which is great because you can install Postgres and use it pretty much anywhere without really having to worry about resources. But the default Postgres configuration parameters might not be right for your production environment. There are a lot of Postgres parameters, uh, 361 in version 16. But you don't need to know about all of them, luckily. Um, you don't even need to know that most of them exist for your database to work well. So if you just have a working knowledge of a few parameters, uh, that can make a big difference. So we'll look at the most important Postgres parameters and some rules of thumb to set them for your use case. Hopefully you'll come away knowing what the parameters do, uh, why they're important, and how to set them so that your Postgres database performs at its best. And then you can leave Postgres to just work and get on with developing your application or whatever is a more important task to you. So we'll look at how to set parameters and how to find information about the current settings. And then we'll look at some of the most important um, parameters by category. I mainly put the agenda up there, and I'll keep referring back to it just so that you can keep track of where we're up to and when I'm likely to stop talking. You can set Postgres, configura Postgres configuration parameters in various ways and at several different levels. So you can set them for the whole cluster, either in the postgresql.conf or via an alter system, which will then put the new value in the postgresql.auto.com. You can set parameters just for the database DB1 using an alter database. You can set parameters just for Bob using an alter role. You could set parameters just for Bob when he connects to database DB1 using alter role in database. You can use the set command to set parameter values for just the current session. And if you add the local keyword, it will just apply to the current transaction. Some parameters can be changed online, some need a restart, some can only be set by super users, and others can be set by any user. The context field in the PG settings view tells you which are which. So there are seven different contexts, and we'll go through them from the most difficult to change through to the easiest. Internal parameters. These ones can't be changed directly but some can be passed as options to initDB when you create your cluster. So these are things like block size, server version, and wall segment size. To change a postmaster parameter, you'll need to restart the server, and this is things like archive mode or max connections. 
to change a SIGUP parameter. You don't need to restart, but you do need to provide the um, modified configuration file to Postgres. So you'll use a pgctl reload or select pgreload.conf to make Postgres pick up those new values. This applies to things like archive command, log destination, and other logging parameters, max wall size, and most of the auto vacuum parameters. There are a few super user backend parameters. These are parameters that can either be changed in the postgresql.conf or a super user can set them for their own session at connection time. Any changes to these parameters won't affect currently running sessions. There are a couple of backend parameters. These are the same as super user backend, but this time any user can set them for their own session at connection time. There are super user parameters, which can set either in the postgresql.conf or a super user can set them within a session. Changes to these parameters will affect existing sessions. And finally, there's the user context, which is the same as super user, but this time any user is allowed to change their own session local value. This one includes parameters such as search path, work mem, um, query tuning parameters such as random page cost. If you want to know what the different parameters are, what they do, how they can be set, et cetera, there are several different places that you can look to find information. You can look in the PostgreSQL documentation. You can look in the default PostgreSQL.conf configuration file. And you can look in the PG settings view, which is where we just looked for the context information. You don't need to read this, by the way. It's just there for information. So the server configuration section, which is chapter 20 of the Postgres documentation, has a subsection per category of parameters. So for example, here we've got parameters related to memory, to checkpoints, and to connections. And this is the kind of information that you'll see for each parameter. So for example, here, this is the information you'd see for the max connections parameter. You'll see things like the name of the parameter, the type of parameter, a description of it, the default value, and its context. When you create a Postgres cluster, you'll get a default postgresql.conf file. It's a fairly verbose file. It contains an overview of how to use it and it contains a list of all of the available parameters. They're grouped as in the documentation. For example, here are some of the connection settings. Commented out values are the default values. And it has descriptions, it has a comment to let you know if it requires a restart to change the parameter, for example. Many people just keep a copy of this file uh, as a reference and then they will actually have a real postgresql.com file that just contains the actual parameters that they've set, so it's much more legible. You can also use the PG settings view to get information, like description, context, min and max values for each parameter. To see the current value of a parameter, you can use the command show parameter, or again, you can use the PG settings view. Show parameter will only display the current value that's in use in the current session. So you can't tell from that whether it's the default value or not, whether it's been changed for that session, or whether it's valid across the whole server. The PG settings view will give you much more information. So this is an example for the max, con max connections parameter. And for legibility, I've not shown all of the columns. You can see that the value has been set in the postgresql.conf. And if you change that value using an alter system, that source file would then change to postgresql.auto.conf. This is another example for the workmen parameter. Here we can see that it hasn't been set in the postgresql.conf. It's been left at its default value. And if you change that via a set workmem, you'd then see session in place of default for the source. So we've looked at how to set parameters and how to look at their values. So now let's look at which parameters you actually want to think about. As I said, and I'll reiterate this, you really don't need to think about all 350 plus configuration parameters. We'll just look at a handful which will usually, usually do the trick. So I've grouped the important ones into categories. First of all, parameters that affect connections to the database. 
Listen addresses isn't going to impact the performance of your database, but it is one that sometimes catches people out, so I've included it here. By default, Postgres only allows local loopback connections via the value localhost for listen addresses. If you try to connect from anywhere else, you'll see a connection refused error, and you'll be asked, is the server running on that host and accepting TCP IP connections? Most people want to allow some external collection connections to their database, so you'll probably want to set, uh, change the default. You can set it to asterisk if you want to allow connections from all available IP addresses, or to all zeros, or to two colons if you want to listen for IPv4 addresses or IPv6, respectively. Or you can specify a list of IP addresses. You then control who can and can't connect to the database using the pghba.conf, the host-based authentication file. Max connections specifies the maximum number of concurrent client connections. The default's 100 on most systems. If max connections is 100 and you're the 101st person to try to connect, you'll get an error. If you're consistently getting this error, you might be tempted to set max connections to a really high value. Just remember that each DB connection does need a certain amount of resource, and Postgres usually works best with up to just a few hundred current, concurrent connections. And Simon did mention this um, limit in his keynote this morning. You may need even fewer than 100 on a small system. If you want or need many hundreds or thousands of connections, you'll need to start looking into connection pooling. Idle in transaction session timeout. So more than once, I've been asked to investigate why queries weren't completing on the database. User queries were queuing up, waiting for a lock, and investigation revealed that someone had started a transaction, run a few queries, and then locked their computer, and then left for lunch, for the weekend, or even to go on holiday. Their transaction was still there, holding on to the locks it had taken. Not only can this block other users, but it can also prevent vacuum from cleaning up dead rows and therefore contribute to table bloat. If you want to avoid this, it's worth setting the idle in transaction session timeout. It's disabled by default. You could set it to, say, 30 minutes, and then uh, it wouldn't impact Alice, for example, who started a transaction and then got distracted for a few minutes by a colleague who wanted to talk about which her favorite PG Confi U talk was but it would prevent too many other sessions being impacted uh, if Bob leaves a trans transaction open and then goes away for a week to explore some other Czech cities. Next, parameters that affect how much memory is available to and used by the database. Shared buffers determines how much memory is dedicated to Postgres to use for caching data. The default is typically 128 meg, that's in 8K blocks. And it's generally good for performance to set it considerably higher if you have enough memory available. A good starting point for that might be between 25 and 40% of the memory in your system, although it might need to be much lower on systems with less than one gig of RAM. Be aware, oops, it went one ahead, be aware that the entire amount is allocated at DB server start time. And the amount you need will depend very much on your use case, so you'll want to test with a range of values to get it right. WorkMem defines the maximum amount of memory that can be used by a query operation before it spills to disk and creates a temporary file. The default for this is 4 meg. Uh, a larger value, for example, you could try 10 meg can improve the performance of queries that um, perform large hash or sort operations. If you use the log temp files setting, you'll be able to see if and when temp files are being created, which would suggest that you need to increase your work mem. Be aware that a complex query might run multiple sort or hash operations in parallel, and that several concurrent sessions could be doing that at the same time. So here I've just given a, a quick example. If you had 50 concurrent users, each of them performing a complex query that's doing four source operations, and you had 10 meg of work mem, that already comes to two gigabytes. It's often better to set work mem to a high value just for the specific sessions that need it, rather than setting it to a high value for all connections. <laughs> 
Maintenance work mem is a similar thing, but this time it's uh, the amount of memory that can be used by maintenance operations, for example, vacuum, create index, alter table add foreign key. The default for this one is 64 meg, but much higher values can improve performance of things like vacuum, restoring database dumps, etc. You won't usually see lots of concurrent maintenance operations, so it's generally fairly safe to set this to a much higher value. A good starting point might be about 5% of your total RAM. A note there, um, by default, auto vacuum can use up to three times work mem. Sorry, maintenance work mem. Okay, next parameters that affect logging. These aren't going to make your database run faster, but knowing what's going on in your database will obviously help to speed up investigating any issues. You can set log min duration statement, for example, to one second, and then the amount of time taken by any queries that run for longer than one second will be logged, um, which can help you to track down unoptimized un queries in your applications. The actual value will, of course, depend on what's normal for your applications, and you probably only want to see outliers rather than most queries. You might also not want this in place all the time on a production system because you could end up with a lot of noise in the logs. Logline prefix is a string added to the beginning of each logline. The default, %m %p, is just the timestamp and process ID, which doesn't give you much information to go on if you're debugging. You can include many different fields and any text you want. So here I've just given an example that includes timestamp, the host that you're connecting from, the database username, the database that's being connected to, and the process ID. And one important bit that I haven't highlighted is just put a space at the end there so you've got a gap between the prefix and your actual log message for legibility. Adding information about who, what, where, when, etc to each log line can make life much easier when it comes to debugging issues. Next, wall. Tuning, tuning your wall, your write-ahead log, and your checkpoints can have a significant impact on performance. Wall buffers controls how much memory is available for wall before it's synced to disk. The default value of minus one means the size is calculated automatically at about 3% of shared buffers, is actually one over 32, up to a maximum of the size of one wall segment, which is 16 meg by default. The contents of the wall buffers are also written out uh, at, check, at every commit, so very large values actually are unlikely to provide a significant benefit. But if you have a large number of concurrent connections, you might find that increasing wall buffers can improve write performance. So I've suggested 32 meg, but again, it's one of those, um, give it a try. Checkpoint timeout. During a checkpoint, Postgres flushes all of your dirty data pages to disk. But don't worry, the changes were already flushed to the wall files. They are already safe. If a checkpoint hasn't taken place within checkpoint timeout seconds, a new checkpoint is going to be triggered. There are other things that can cause a checkpoint, but you really want them to be triggered by a, a timeout so that you've got predictable behavior. A checkpoint is an expensive I.O. intensive operation, and it results in some additional wall activity. So you don't want it to happen too often. On the other hand, if you leave too long between checkpoints, crash recovery can take a long time because changes since the last checkpoint have to be reapplied and you need space to store those wall files. The default's five minutes, but most people find that too low, and most people seem to set it to somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes. OK, max wall size. A checkpoint will also be triggered if the wall directory fills to max wall size. Well, actually, if max wall size amount of wall is generated since the last trigger, I should say that, or since the last checkpoint. The default value here is one gigabyte, which is equivalent to 64 16 meg wall files. We saw before, you ideally want your checkpoints to be triggered by a timeout, 
but max wall size can help you to make sure you don't run out of space in the wall directory if you have an unexpected large amount of wall generated. The docs recommend setting um, your max wall size to a half, I'm going to read this because it's directly from the docs, a half to two thirds of the available disk space where the wall's located. But that doesn't help you to determine how big your wall directory actually needs to be. Log checkpoints, which is on by default, lets you monitor your logs to see when and why checkpoints are being triggered. If they're frequently triggered because of max wall size, or if you're close to filling your wall directory, then you'll want to look at maybe reducing your checkpoint timeout or adding space to your wall directory or potentially both. A couple of parameters that affect how the operator executes queries that are worth looking at. First one, effective cache size. So a note about effective cache size, it isn't a memory allocation. It's an estimate of how much memory is available for disk caching after we take into account what's used by the OS and other applications. The value is used as a guideline by the query planner to decide whether or not plans are likely to fit into memory. The default, manu uh, the default value for this is four gigabytes. If the value is too low, the planner might decide not to use certain indexes, even if they'd speed up a query. A conservative value for this might be uh, half of the total of memory available on your uh, server, although it can be higher if you've got a dedicated database server. I've uh, just left a note there, so you want to make sure that uh, effective cache size plus shared buffers is less than 100% of total memory on the system, maybe leaving 5% for the operating system. Random page cost is another guideline for the query planner. It suggests how long it will take for your disks to seek a random disk page as a multiple of how long a sequential read takes. So it assumes the sequential read takes one, whatever one is. Um, a lower value makes index scans preferred and a higher value makes index scans look more expensive. If you've got particularly fast disks, and especially if you've got solid state drives, which a lot of people do now, the default value of, sorry, I've got ahead of my slides, there you go, so lower values. Um, the default value of four is probably gonna be much too high for, for those fast disks. For SSDs, we often recommend 1.1. Okay, and finally, I slipped an extra item into the agenda, a couple of parameters that are best left alone. F-Sync and auto-vacuum. You can dramatically improve the performance of your database by doing away with the pesky F-Sync calls that Postgres uses to make sure that updates are physically written to disk. After all, the only benefit is the assurance that your database um, can recover to a consistent state after an operating system or hardware crash. This is such a bad idea in most cases that the default PostgreSQL.conf contains a fairly clear warning against switching this off. Uh, turning this off can cause and can cause, maybe should say will most likely cause, unrecoverable data corruption. If you're particularly brave, or if you are in the rare case where um, you can easily recreate your database um, from external data, you might consider this a worthwhile risk. Otherwise, if you value the data in your database, you probably want to leave F-Sync on. Switching off synchronous commit, potentially just for specific sessions rather than for the whole cluster is another way to achieve similar performance improvements if performance is more important to you than reliability. You don't risk discorruption, you don't risk corruption, but you do risk losing apparently committed data because uh, if there's a server crash, um, Postgres will have potentially committed without waiting for the wall to be written to disk. And the other one that I've put in the don't touch category is auto vacuum. Um, 
The docs describe autovacuum as an optional but highly recommended feature. When it's enabled, which it is by default, autovacuum worker processes will check for tables that have had a large number of updates, and it will execute vacuum or analyze as needed. If you've got a performance issue, you might look into your database, and a lot of people seem to do this, uh, see what's running in the database, see some auto-vacuum processes running that seem to have been running for a long time and using up a lot of resources. Aha, you might think. That's what's slowing things down. I'll just switch auto-vacuum off and everything will speed up. Please don't do that. Unless you've got some very clear and reliable process in place to make sure that your tables are vacuumed as needed, you could end up having some very uh, costly offline maintenance to perform if things go wrong. It can be useful to set log auto vacuum min duration equals zero so that you'll see in your logs when auto vacuum ran and what it did. And from version 15 onwards, you've got much more verbose information there than you did in previous versions. So I've put this up as a summary. These are the parameters that we've looked at. So to do with connections and sessions, listen addresses to make sure that people can actually connect to your database. Max connections, not too high. Idle in transaction session timeout so people don't go on holiday and block the whole database. Shared buffers for caching. Work mem and maintenance work mem for user and maintenance query operations. Log min duration statement, so you can see long running queries. Log line prefix to give you the information you need in your logs for debugging purposes. Wall buffers, checkpoint timeout, and max wall size to control how often checkpoints are happening. Effective cache size and random page cost, so the query planner's got the information that it needs. And finally, F-sync and auto vacuum to leave alone. And if you don't have the time or energy to look at all of them, maybe just start with these five. That will probably have a reasonable impact. So my conclusions are that Postgres really does just work, and you shouldn't need to do too much to it. If you want it to work even better, try setting the 13 parameters that we looked at, but leave F-Sync and AutoVacuum alone. You shouldn't really need to know more than that in general unless you run into issues or if you have a particular um, specific use case. The values that I've suggested for all of these parameters are just starting points. It's a rule of thumb. You will want to try out different values for yourself. Change one thing at a time and test to find out what works in your system. Once you've done that, you can leave your database to look after itself, and you can concentrate on whatever's most important to you, such as developing your application. And I think I actually have time for questions. Could they be easy ones, please? Check, check. No, thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I was wondering, what are your thoughts on like maybe automatically tuning some of these parameters at startup? I realize there's some that very much depend on like whether there's other stuff running on the server, but for example, the random page costs, stuff like that, might be something where it might be something where might be useful to have some tool that you can just run and that suggests values depending on tests on your actual hardware. I think that sounds like an excellent thing that you should develop. <laughs> Any more questions?
you told about uh, after vacuum parameters that uh, they don't touch. Uh, of course, we don't want to turn uh, after vacuum off, but what about uh, more detailed tuning? There, there are some several after vacuum parameters. Absolutely, uh, yeah. So the one that I said not to touch is auto vacuum itself, not to switch it off, but absolutely it can be worthwhile tuning auto vacuum. So that's one of the reasons that I suggest monitoring, you know, so you, um, let me go back. Uh, no. <coughs> Actually using the back would work better, wouldn't it? I do know how to use computers, I promise. Okay, where were we? Auto vacuum. So yes, that parameter there, log auto vacuum min duration, that means you'll get information in your logs about when auto vacuum ran and what it did so that it, if you have issues with auto vacuum, you can then start looking at the aut other auto vacuum parameters to potentially tune it if it needs to be more aggressive or it needs to happen more often or that kind of thing. Any questions? Okay, we have one. <laughs> it's my fitness today. I'm just seeing how many steps I will make. So I got a question about the uh, effective gas size in this case. Um, yes. The rule of thumb is 50 to 70% in this case. Um, however, uh, in our case, we have a database server with a dedicated server which has 1.8 terabytes of memory. Mm -hmm. With the 1.8 terabytes of memory, with 50%, you have about 900 gigabytes of for the effective cache size. I would think that that would be overkill in this case, right? I would say it's very hard for me to know that without knowing the size of your database, what, what's happening on it, how many concurrent things you've got going on. Probably, but it's hard to know. I can give the classic consultant answer, it depends. Where to send your money? <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, Karen.